As a small business owner, your to-do list is long. The Knot makes advertising easy and connects you with the right couples at the right time. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast for 15% off your first month with code podcast15. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 390, The Battle of Knightsbridge Box. By June 11th, the battle at Bir Hakim, involving the fighting French, was over. Rommel now controlled that ground, but Ritchie invited Auchinleck to come to his headquarters at Gambit to see how well the 8th Army had survived Rommel's latest foray. Of course, Ritchie did not have all the facts. Had he, he would have had less jauntiness in his voice. But he would learn the truth soon enough, a truth that Rommel was already guessing at. Namely, that the Axis powers were soon to have more tanks than 8th Army. As it stood, Ritchie had 248 to the Desert Fox's 219. Auchinleck flew up on June 12th, but Rommel was about to demonstrate another tactic that he had come up with in the desert. He wrote, Reconnaissance reports must reach the commander in the shortest possible time. He must take his decisions immediately. Speed of action decides the battle. Commanders of motorized forces must therefore operate as near as possible to their troops. Soon enough, the various commanders under Ritchie would be accused of that very thing, or rather not being close enough to their troops to respond to unexpected situations. Still, to his credit, 13th Corps Commander William Strafer Gott had been busy since Rommel retreated back into the cauldron a few days prior. Gott had figured out that Rommel was trying to do several things at once. First, he was trying to approach Tobruk from the south, and if he could do this, then all those infantry troops along the Gazala line would be cut off from supplies or a pathway to retreat. To counter this, Gott pulled men and equipment from the 1st South African and 50th Divisions and had them form a non-consecutive line that went west to east that started in the middle of the Gazala line where the 69th Brigade box was at, running east by northeast and stopping at the Akroma box near the southwest corner of Tobruk's defense perimeter. And where there were not men, Mines, by the thousands, had been laid down. With that done, Gott was hoping if the panzers swung wide again to the south and then turned north, they would be in for a nasty surprise. Next, after hitting a minefield or a fortified position along this new line, then Allied anti-tank guns and planes could savage the surviving panzers. Again, the plan had always been Take Rommel's tanks away from him, and when he retreats, follow hard upon his heels with your tanks. This was a solid plan by Gott, but of course the important part of it was hitting the Axis forces once they ran into some part of this new defensive line. And that's where the trouble was. The tension between Gott and Major General Dan Pinar of the 1st South African Division was growing. By this time, neither man thought much of the other person or of the people under their command. Yes, even in war, personal slights or clashes that can cloud one's enthusiasm or judgment was among the men of the 8th Army. This episode is brought to you by Dave. When you need money in a pinch, Dave can help. It's a banking app that can help you get up to $500 instantly. No interest, late fees, or credit check. Join the millions already using Dave to get financial relief and sign up for an extra cash account to get up to $500 instantly. Go to dave.com slash Spotify or download the Dave app now. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. On June 11th, the day after Bir Hakim had fallen, and clearly wasting no time, Rommel had his panzers resume their swing south and then turn north to make for Tobruk and to cut off the infantry along the Gazala line. It seems that Gott's new defensive line was about to pay off handsomely. 
looking at this latest Axis attack like a half circle that has three rings. The 21st Panzer and Ariete divisions were on the innermost path and would be heading north before the other divisions, and they were to make for the Knight's Bridge position about 10 miles due south of the eastern end of Gott's new line. To be clear, they were to demonstrate and be noticed. The reason for this demonstration was that Rommel wanted whatever tanks and personnel were around the Knight's Bridge box and he did not yet know of the new line by Gott, to be pinned down there. But, as the day's travel would play out, the 21st and Ariete would actually end up just west of Knightsbridge box. Meanwhile, the second ring of this half-circle was made up of the 15th Panzer and the Trieste divisions, and they would drive north to the right of the 21st Panzer and Ariete. They would end up to the southeast of Knightsbridge box. This left the 90th Light Division, the most outer of the three rings, to swing the widest before turning north, and they were to go after El Abdin, about 22 miles or 35 kilometers due east of the Knightsbridge box. If you may remember, the 90th had tried this already in the earlier days of the Battle of Gazala. Well, here was their second chance. In other words, the 21st Panzer and Ariete on the left flank would tie down troops, as would the right flank of the 90th Light Division, which left the middle column to head in between them and to make for Tobruk. This was a solid plan, but the news got even better for the Desert Fox. Recently arrived and now incorporated into his three attacking columns were eight Panzer Mark III's and six even newer Panzer Mark IVs, the latter having an impressive long-barreled 75mm gun. And yet, there was a downside. There always is in war. The various Panzer divisions were running low on infantry, men with rifles to actually help defend the tanks. Currently, the 90th Light was down to 1,000 men, and the other two Panzer divisions, infantry regiments, had about one-third their normal number. Whereas Ritchie, due to the way this battle was unfolding, still had an impressive number of motorized infantry. As for air power, both sides were roughly evenly matched. Of course, fighters and bombers are only good if they are given a target. And air reconnaissance had not been great of late for either side. The Panzers in their three columns had moved out at 3 p.m. on June 11th. But the center column, that is, of the 15th and Trieste, did not get very far. Ritchie was told that the Axis forces were now moving north, so he sent the 4th Armored Brigade Group to leave Knight's Bridge Box and head southeast, putting them on the path of the set column. Of course, this meant that Gott's new line would be left unused, but it's doubtful that Ritchie and Gott even had a conversation about this. Once the opposing sides met, they spent the night in the desert watching each other. Meanwhile, the 90th Light Division had closed in on El Abdin, but just before getting there, they ran into a reconnaissance unit south of it. The 90th Light surrounded this smaller Allied force, getting ready to destroy it before moving on to El Abdin. By this time, it was apparent to Ritchie, Gott, and Nori that Rommel had split his panzer forces. This was the opportunity to do to the Axis what they had done to the 150th Brigade Group. As things stood, the Axis left column of the 21st and Ariete divisions were to the west of the Knight's Bridge box and about 20 miles or 32 kilometers away from the middle column, that of the 15th and Trieste divisions. With that being the case, General Willoughby Norrie of 30th Corps had the 2nd and 4th Armored Brigades of Messervy's 7th Armored Division get ready to hit the 15th Panzer and Trieste the next day. But just to make sure the 21st Panzer and Ariete Divisions did not drive east to help their comrades, Lumsden's 1st Armored Division, specifically the 22nd Armored and 32nd Army Tank Brigades, were to stay close to the Axis far-left column. Currently, they were just north of the Germans and the Italians. But Rommel's radio specialists heard all these commands and told Rommel 
Rommel, because he was with his troops, altered his plans slightly, and he told the 15th Panzer and Trieste to dig in. Let the British tanks come. The German artillery and their new tanks would take care of them. No sense in wasting his armor and gas. It had worked brilliantly so far. But June 12th would be a strange day for both sides, where very little went according to plan. First, Messervy of the 7th Armored Division was not happy with Norrie's plans for the 2nd and 4th Armor Brigades, so went to the latter's headquarters for a chat. But along the way, he ran into the last of the 90th Light Division that was traveling east, and he had to hide. Suddenly, 7th Armored had no commander nor orders, as Messervy had wanted to talk to Norrie first. Those men sat there in the sun on their tanks, waiting to be told what to do. Whereas the 15th Panzer and Trieste were waiting to be attacked by the 4th and 2nd Armor Brigades, who weren't doing that or anything, as they were still waiting for orders. By noon, General Walter Nering of Africa Corps realized the Allies were not coming to the party, so he ordered the two divisions to attack the British position which had their tanks in between the Knightsbridge box and the 15th and Trieste, further to the southeast. The Germans and Italians moved out, but not with much pep, as they were exhausted. Also, it was hot and hazy, which made things hard to see until one was very close to something, which is a bad idea in war. But the Axis gunners took advantage of the haze and started shooting at the British tanks, with their crews not sure what to do, because, again, they still had no orders. The number of British tanks was shrinking once more. When early afternoon came, Rommel and Norrie, independently of course, decided to attack, roughly at the same time. Rommel had the 21st Panzer and Ariete drive east and hit the 2nd and 4th Armor Brigades from the rear, they would have to go past the Knightsbridge box, but Rommel was not going to pass up this opportunity. The far-left column started moving, and a little later hit the 2nd and 4th Armored as ordered, with the 15th Panzer still attacking the British from the front. It took a little longer, but Norrie eventually realized that Messervy was out of the picture, for whatever reason. So Norrie told Lumsden to take tactical control of the battle. He was also to drive east and hit the 21st in the rear, while the 21st was attacking the two armored brigades from the rear. Poetic justice. But there was nothing beautiful about this. As the Germans and Italians had drove south of the Knightsbridge box, the 22nd Armor Brigade had driven north by them. This took longer, and by the time they got there, what was left of the 2nd and 4th had retreated which left the panzers in the area to focus on this newly arrived 22nd Armored Brigade, which they then proceeded to shred. The 4th Armored Brigade had retreated to the north, while the 2nd and 22nd Armored Brigades retreated east. These two were chased by the Germans, but fortunately, darkness came and saved them. By day's end, the British had lost another 100 tanks. Rommel truly had, whether he knew it or not, an advantage in armor. Ironically, or not, that day of June 12th, Auchinleck was with Ritchie at his Gambit headquarters, and they heard nary a word of what was going on. So when the CNC flew back to Cairo that night, his report to London had such phrases as, Atmosphere here, good. The realities of situation are being faced calm and resolutely, which is easy to do and right when one does not know what the hell the realities are. If the battlefield at this point can be thought of as a chessboard, then Rommel controlled the center of the board. He had opportunities of movement. The Allied forces, not so much. Also, the Desert Fox was with his panzers, thus he knew the situation on the ground. Ritchie nor Nori were close enough to their men to have an idea until it was radioed in, and as we have seen, the various British forces in play were rather busy that day, retreating in different directions. 
Given the current situation, General Gott's 13th Corps should have been pulled back from the Gazala line, given that there was a growing salient behind them. But the CNC and Ritchie, again not knowing the details, were still of the hope that Rommel would exhaust himself and his men, either operationally or logistically. And yes, his men were tired, but those that perceive themselves to be winning find a way to go on. The British collective thinking was, at some point soon, Rommel will push his men and machines too hard, and then the South African troops along the Gazala line could close up and cut off Rommel's supply and communications completely. Then he would be stuck wherever he was and could be destroyed in Ritchie's own good time. And to add to this sorry state, as Ritchie did not know what was going on, Auchinleck did not know what was going on, and because of his ignorance, Churchill did not know what was going on. Thus, the Prime Minister, thinking he had finally found a general that would stand and fight, wrote, Your decision to fight it out to the end is most cordially endorsed. We shall sustain you whatever the result. Retreat would be fatal. This is a business not only of armor, but of willpower. God bless you all. Stirring sentiments, to be sure, but compliments from on high do not repair damaged tanks or create new ones out of whole cloth. Rommel would be at it again the next day. A beautiful day in nature. Take it from a little bug like me. Nothing makes you feel more alive. <laughs> oh, whoa, I almost got frogged. That was a close call. But boy, do I feel capital A alive. Luckily for you humans, Nature's Way put that thrilling feeling of aliveness in a bottle. Nature's Way Alive Women's Multivitamin Gummies with 16 vitamins and minerals. Delicious multivitamins inspired by nature. Whoa, better luck next time, pal. Nature's Way.